don't know what you're waiting for, you've got to go get this book, Do the New You. It's out right now. Just like Pastor Stephen said, we're going to get these sayings in our minds and out of our mouths. So go to do the new you.com to order your book today. It's out. Go get it. In just a moment, if you're standing at one of our campuses, stay standing for a moment because uh, we got a very special message today. You may be wondering, yes, is Holly going to preach? Kind of. <laughs> sort and of. so am I. Yeah. So today, this message. Did you ever used to watch, not wrestling, but wrestling? Did you ever used to see tag team wrestling like <laughs> the Legion of Doom, the Steiner Brothers? stuff like that, and then when you, would, when you would be tired, you'd tag your partner in the corner. Today, Holly and I are going to tag team a message as we continue our series called Do the, the new, new You. Would you look at your neighbor and say, I barely recognize you. You've been changing so much. <laughs> Is that you? Put it in the comments. Say, Is that you? Oh, man. God has been doing an amazing work through this book, through this message series, through these mindsets, and uh, today we're going we're gonna to change it up. You may be wondering, why is there furniture behind you? Good question. Uh, Holly… We're going to have a little chat. And I, we're going to chat. That's right. We're going to talk about some yeah. stuff. I've been wanting to talk to you about some stuff. Okay, but you said, you said we were going to tag team, and in my mind, it was less wrestling and more like um, volleyball, you know, like yeah, that's where, good. where I don't know my, vo- you know, like the person <laughs> yeah, who throws a spike. Bump, yeah, and then you, yeah. So I'm spiking or you're spiking? You're spiking. Okay. Maybe right. I'm the setter. You know, you go like yeah. that. That's what it is. Yeah. And then you spike it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be spiking Steve. I wish I knew more about sports. <laughs> Just. I think you did good. Okay. Yeah. But I have been wanting to interview you for a really, I have been begging him, babe, please let me interview you. Let's sit down on a Sunday morning. And because there's nobody I would rather talk to than you. Thank you. And sometimes our conversations are so, I mean, they're so good. And they go, I just love the way you think. And so I'm really excited. I've got questions. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. And um, y'all, y'all pray for me because she's prepared. I'm not. <laughs> I made a deal that I wouldn't look at her questions. She left her notebook on the kitchen table, and I was very tempted because I like to prepare. Her. But um, in this mindset, we're going to share about Christ is in me. Everybody say, Christ is in me. Christ is in me. I am enough. I am enough. And I thought, what better way to put that to the test than let her ask me whatever she wants <laughs> in front of? We've got. About a thousand e group leaders here helping us share this message. And these are the real MVPs right. of Elevation Church, along with our volunteers, right. our givers, our staff. And, you know, this is what they do every week as yeah. they open their homes and open their computers, and whether it's in the room where it happens or the Zoom where it happens. <laughs> um, so many great discussions happen, and one of my passions in this year is to get God's Word deeper and deeper and That's deeper right. into your heart That's so right. the enemy can't snatch That's it. Right. So if you're ready for a conversation that could go anywhere, make some noise. All right. Y'all be seated as we are seated. Let's go, Holly. Woo. When they were playing, it made me remember how we used to sing. When I think about the Lord. You can't make me sing. How He saved me. How he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost when I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet. On solid ground, it makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. They know it. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and and all 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Of all the glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. That was our song in college. That was a special Wasn't it? I think, I think that's part of the reason you married me. <laughs> Not because of my singing, but she was scholarship. We, we met before college. Oh Holly and I met before college. I promise this won't just be story time. I'm, I'm going to preach and minister the, the word of God. Today. <laughs> but I want to tell them this because when people see you like later in your journey, it's like walking into the middle of a movie, yeah. and they can be really confused. And one time somebody said uh, to me, I don't really like mega church pastors as if I came out of the womb right. <laughs> with a mega church. Like, right. <laughs> push, there's a, there's, a, there's a mega church inside of you, Faith. Heard it? And, uh, but as far as our relationship and our ministry, we've been doing this together since we were kids. Yeah. Since we were, the 19. church just turned eight, 18. Yeah. We started doing ministry when we were 18. Yeah. And then the summer we were 19, we traveled together, and yeah. she was on scholarship to this uh, singing group called Joyful Sound, but she was the sound person. But I knew she really wanted to sing. You didn't know I was, had a background in… Yes, yeah, she has a background in running <laughs> JBL eons. She can set up a tent revival anywhere <laughs> if you snake. need her to. I'm good with the snake. And uh, you, should start, you should start a sound company for worship events called Hallelujah. <laughs> That'd be good. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you in a minute because I know it's your, your interview, and we're <laughs> going to preach and teach today, not just tell stories. But um, so I made a choir, and uh, guess who I recruited to be my alto section leader? Hallelujah. Okay, wait. I, I have to interject because you, he was casting this vision like he does. Um, we were 19 years old, and he was like, I'm going I'm to start a a choir. We're going to have a choir and a band. There's going to be just, we're just going to sing gospel songs. And I was like, Not, I don't, okay. And, and he was like, and, and, uh, and I want you to help. And I was like, I don't know. And there was this other girl. Yeah, tell the truth. There was this other girl, and she was like, that sounds awesome. I mean, how can I help? And I was like, I didn't say I wasn't going to help. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I was like, oh, hold on a second. A little healthy competition. <laughs> so, what are we talking okay, about, Ollie? So <laughs> what are we doing? All right. You called this meeting. I did. I called this meeting. Um, first of all, I. I am so, um, I love this book so much. And um, it's very special to me. I matched my jacket to the book today. Um, it's so special to me because um, you haven't released a book in eight years. And what a lot of people don't know is about a year ago, we had a fight. Well, a conversation, a, yeah. a, a rather heated conversation. And yeah. I was saying, because um, we don't fight. Yeah, it was, uh, it's, as the Baptists say, intense fellowship. Intense fellowship. <laughs> so we have this intense conversation where I am saying, like, there's, I just feel like there's more inside of you. I feel like there is um, a, a, a huge group of people who need your words in written form. And um, he was telling me how his sermons don't translate into books. He said, my sermons, my ideas, Holly, they, they, I've tried. Um, he actually, you actually wrote a book in 2020 that we never released. And he said, I tried, I wrote a book in 2020. I'm done. I don't want to write. I, I, my sermons don't translate. And um, we went back and forth and I felt like I had pushed too hard, you know, like that wife pushing. And I was like, okay, okay. So I decided um, I was going to let it go, and I was going to push the Lord. <laughs> it's so much more effective. And, and this is the answer to my prayers right here. She fights dirty. 
She fights dirty. Y'all think she's sweet? Okay. Um, so we're talking about this mindset. Christ is in me. I am enough. We opened up by talking about how you said, I'm not a writer. Basically, I'm not enough. I don't have enough. So how did you, where did this come from? How did you get from I'm not enough to I, I have enough to give? One word at a time, followed by some commas, periods, <laughs> other words. Somebody told me you never have to write a book. You just have to write a word, mm. then a word, then a word, then a word. And then when you said enough of those, you put a period, <laughs> exclamation point. If the point is weak, put an exclamation point to compensate for the weakness of the point and then move on. Um, in all seriousness, though, you know how we say that God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path? I guess yeah. I'm, I'm still thinking about light because everything that God used me to do up to this point in my life, he never gave me a floodlight that I could see a hundred yards away. Right, right. He never even gave me headlights where I could see farther down the road. In Bible times, they had a light that you would wear that would just light your, your feet. And so when the Bible says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, it means that God will give me enough light to take the next step by and to see that there's a hole and I should step around it. Yeah. But he won't show right. me everything that's down the road because then I would trust the path, yeah. not the person. Right. And this book was like that. You know, this mm. church is like that. Every yes. sermon that I preach, yeah. every time I write a song, and everything that, that you're doing, because I don't really want this conversation today to be about how I wrote a book or how I'm enough. I really want to get inside of your soul, if right. we're able to do that through a conversation, and just begin to think about uh, what are the ways that not enoughness keeps you from showing up? Right. What are the ways that not enoughness keeps you from even finding out? One thing about not enough is it's partially true. It's partially true. Hmm. Come on. If you were just starting to work out and you said, I want big quads like Sam Sulik, and I said, All right, let's put 405 on the squat rack, you would not have enough muscle for 405 on the Come squat on. rack if you haven't been in the gym right. this year. But however, if I put you under the bar, which is 45 pounds, and we got you to 10 reps, 20 reps, got you comfortable with the motions, and we built and built and built and built and built and built and got you some steroids, <laughs> got you a little gear. Um, kidding about the steroids, but not kidding about the growth process, right. is that you have to start with the bar in your spiritual life. You know, I really want to be a person of prayer. Don't book a three-week prayer retreat in Ireland <laughs> and say, I'm going to do that in 10 years when the kids are out of the house. Right. I found some of my best prayers. I have a little chair right next to where I get dressed, and just plopping down in that chair for 30 seconds sometimes and yeah. saying, Oh God. Oh God. Yep. Oh God, Jesus, Holy Ghost, Mother Mary, Tom Petty. <laughs> you know, because every prayer doesn't start pretty. Yeah. And this project didn't start pretty. I mean, it was me with voice memos and kind of not having much confidence in myself. Um, I remember one day in particular where my conversation with Holly was like, ringing in my ears, and I had the whole afternoon free. I'd finished everything for the morning, and uh, it was like her voice and God's voice were singing in harmony. <laughs> when we call her the Holy Spirit, we're obviously just kidding around. She doesn't think that she's God's voice, but God's really used her as an instrument in my life. And uh, By the way, sometimes God will speak to you through the people who are right in front of you. That's true. So all of us who want to know, well, how do I hear from God, sometimes it's through something that sounds annoying to you from somebody right. who loves you. Oh. And so I'm not saying I was annoyed with I'm you. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> well, 
Anointed and annoying can sometimes feel the same. So sometimes the most anointed things that you've said to me have been the most annoying on the surface because it challenges this thing. Well, she doesn't get it and she doesn't know. But one day in particular, I had this feeling like if you're going to start this book, you need to start and you feel that it's time for you to give another book. And these are a lot of the things when, when you get this book. And if you're in this book, I wrote it to myself. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I wrote it to myself to challenge myself from the old mindset. And then I wrote it for you. Yeah. But before I wrote it for you, I wrote it to myself. Yeah, you just, I want to verify that. All of the mindsets are things that I saw scribbled on legal pads next to your bedside table, next to your desk. These are all things that you wrote for yourself to coach yourself. This mindset, Christ is in me, I am enough, was like a breathing exercise I started doing 10 years ago. Yeah. Christ is in me, we feel like the breathing in, remind me that I'm filled with his spirit, Yeah. and that Jesus isn't just a historical figure who died a long time ago. He is a historical figure who died a long time ago, but he's a very present help in the time of trouble, and the power of him that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Yeah. So when I say Christ is in me, I'm saying resurrection power is in me. Right. When I'm saying Christ is in me, I'm saying healing is in me. When I'm saying Christ is in me, anybody on this side realize that when you say Christ is in me, somebody shout Christ is in me. Christ is in me. I am enough. I am enough. It's it's a it's a truth and a consequence because yeah. he's in me. I am enough. And so one day I'm sitting there going like, you can't write this book. You tried in 2020. You wasted time. You wasted money. You hold yourself up doing it. And I just got overwhelmed by this idea. You need to do something. Now, the first mindset in Do the New You is I'm not stuck unless I stop. Right. And sometimes God will give you something stupid to do, yeah. seems stupid to you, to get you unstuck. Come on. Raising a staff over the Red Sea looks stupid. Right. But I saw a commercial one time that says, it's only weird until it works. I know a lot of people think we're weird as Christians because we praise God right, and we lift our hands. And Well, I'm not one of those hand-lifting, out loud singing Christians, but you know what I found? It works for me. Worship works for me That's right. That's right. when nothing else can help me. So on this particular day, I did something that felt so stupid. I set up an appointment with my literary agent, who hadn't heard from me in quite a while because I was ducking her because I didn't want to write a book. I put on a suit, went to the office in a suit. Y'all, I don't even wear suits on Easter most times in church. And I went to the office to let the devil know I meant business. Now, I know what you're thinking. You just wanted to impress your agent. No. She wasn't on a Zoom call. It was a phone call. She didn't even see me. She didn't even see me. I wasn't dressing so she would see me in a suit. I wanted the devil to see me in a suit to let him know. Just look at the person next to you and say, I'm doing it this time. Doing it this time. Put it in the chat. I'm doing it this time. And that was a day that. I sat down and wrote the whole book in that day. No. That's the story we want. Nope, nope, like, and nope. God healed my marriage that day, and my kid got off drugs that day, no. and the business was out of the red that, that day, day. Uh-uh. and the breakthrough concept went to market, and we had an IPO that day, no. and I never struggled with wanting to drink alcohol again that day, but it was my one-day day win. win. Let's for go. that day. So, I'm going to give you my favorite phrase that I learned in therapy, okay? okay. Yes, I go to therapy because I'm crazy. <laughs> no, you're not. And I want to help you with your crazy in case you don't get to the therapist. All right? All right. So, I, I, I'm not going to charge you for this. <laughs> But we worked through a phrase in therapy. This was a game changer for me. When you talk about enough, everybody shout enough. Enough. Put it in the comments. Enough. Enough. Say it again. Enough. Enough. For now. For now. Woo. 
That was big to me, babe, because you know how I am. I'm projecting so much into the future, and I operate sometimes from a fear of running out. Yeah. But then I remember Jesus taught his disciples to pray this, give us this day our daily bread. Right. Don't you wish he would have said, this day our monthly bread? Yeah. <laughs> so you could have the whole closet full of paper towels that you need? Yeah. But God's not like Costco like that. <laughs> He's not giving it to you in a pack of 48. He's going to give you One the strength when you need it. Yeah. One word at a time. One apology at a time. Ooh. One day of sobriety at a time. Right. One day of coming to church at a time. Mm. One day of going to E group at a time. Come on. And so I don't want you to think that now that I've written a book, I live in a place of perpetual enoughness where in the abundance of God never leaves the forefront of my imagination, causing me to triumph over every doubt and obstacle. I just trust that he's going to give me enough for time. now. Yeah. And when I need the so next beautiful. step, this is for somebody who's making a decision and you feel like you're not intelligent enough to make it or you don't have enough facts to make it. You have enough for now. For now. now. Yeah. Suit up and see. Okay. Did I talk too long? No. Please I know you got a don't lot of questions. stop talking. I do. I have plenty of questions, but you say what, what comes out. If we run out of time, we'll put a bonus session. Oh, that's great. I'm running back, walk it out. I love it. All right. This is my top, one of my top two quotes in the entire book. And I'm going to just read it for you. You say this, what's been a lot harder for me than accepting Jesus is accepting Stephen. Accepting Jesus took a moment. Accepting me is taking a lifetime. To accept, then you go on to say, to accept Jesus but not accept Stephen is to miss the gift of salvation where it matters most. You can't just accept Jesus by faith. You have to accept yourself by faith too. This quote like leapt off the page for me because I grew up Southern Baptist and Baptists, we love the phrase, accept Jesus into your heart. I mean, that is like a core belief of mine. Yeah. You have to accept Jesus into your heart. It's, yeah. a, it's a moment. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monumental decision in your life. But when I read this, I was like, oh, I think I missed half of it. Where, where did this, how do you do this? How do you practically grow in accepting Stephen? How, how, give us some how. You help. <laughs> you do. You know, I, I don't know if you remember saying this, but you've heard me say that you said it a lot. <laughs> and so trust me, you said this. <laughs> We're sitting at Firebirds on a date night. This was maybe 12 years ago, maybe even longer than that, but the church was growing. I remember the day that the church got bigger than Monk's Corner, the town I grew up in. That was kind of a scary thought for me, like, wait a minute. Talk about I'm not enough. The town I grew up in, it was wonderful, but there were less people that lived in that town when I grew up in it than are coming to church now. So not only have I never seen anything this big and led it, but I lived in a town that was smaller than what I'm responsible to lead. And one day I wanted to fire everybody. And uh, most of all, I wanted to fire myself because I'm like, wait a minute. If the whole team is messing up, they fire the coach, right? <laughs> like, so you don't just trade players. If every player is bad, you get a new coach. So I'm telling her this. I'm like, if the, all the team is bad, then you fire the new coach. I just don't feel like I'm the leader that our church needs. Without hesitation, she leans across the bread at Firebirds. Y'all know that bread at Firebirds? I know the bread. She leans across the bread. She's got the butter knife in her hand. It's a big old knife, so it made what she said more powerful. She said, I said, I don't feel like I'm the leader we need. She said, well, you're the one we've got. <laughs> With a knife. 
Those Firebird's knives are big. That helps. He used to tell me when I was walking out the door when the kids were little, you've got what it takes. And again, almost hearing that would make me angry. I didn't go, put her there, buckaroo. I would be like, yeah, yeah, you don't know how heavy it is. And then you were carrying your own pressures of trying to figure out who am I. And I think we've, we've worked through this together. Yeah. Um, because we started in ministry as kids together. And the part of the story that I didn't tell earlier is that before we went to college, Holly was traveling with a ministry team through Monk's Corner. And I grew up in a Methodist church with a heritage from that church because my grandfather was a Methodist pastor. And so we went every week. But then when I was in high school, the Baptist church revival, when I went over there, I met this guy named Jody who ended up being my brother-in-law. So it's a whole story, right? Like God is always working everything together very, very in our deep. lives for his glory. But um, at that revival, I went down to the altar and I was like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to accept Jesus into my life. Right. And it was transformative. Like, what an amazing deal that is. Yeah. I give him my sin, I get his grace. Yeah. I give him my shame, I get his justification. Right. I give him my broken pieces. He begins to build my life into a bigger picture story that he's telling right. for his glory. Right. Who wouldn't want to accept that? Right. It'd be like giving away the Apple goggles thing today, the, the, the thing that's going to make us all robots and send us all to the mark of the beast, the, the new thing that just came out, the end times goggles. Um, I get, Apple's going to take this sermon down if I keep going. But yeah, it'd be like giving something away, like, here you go, and, and, and God is a giver. Right. And so there's no strings attached. Yeah. You leave your sin, you leave your shame, but you don't leave yourself. Yeah. I, I need to get this. Woo. I need to get this through Come because on. one of the ways that we are taught salvation is actually destructive to our sense of self worth. Right. And it's this: God doesn't like you. God, in fact, is so angry with you that the only way He could deal with it was sending his son to die for you. Now, did God send Jesus to die for us because we couldn't pay the penalty? Yes. Yes, because sin demands a price, right. and the price is perfection, and you couldn't pay it, so right. Jesus did. How many are grateful that he did? Yes. Come on, all of my fellow perfectionists, that you don't have to get it right all the time, that he got it right. Right. He lived as if he had sinned right. so I can live as if I never did, so I can so hold my head up, right. so I can belong to Jesus. But here's the part that got me. I started hearing it described in certain classes that I took for Bible college and all of that, almost like a group insurance policy. Jesus died for you. God really doesn't like you. He really can't stand you because he knows all about you, and he sees you at three in the morning, and he knows where you were last night, and he knows what you did last summer and last fall. You're so funny. <laughs> Thank you. And because he can't stand you, he sent his son. And now, when he sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees his son. And because he doesn't have to look, at your terrible, worthless Come self, on. he loves you. Keep going. Cool. It's like I have a pre existing condition called sucking. <laughs> but I prayed a prayer, accepted Jesus, I got in on the policy, and I'm good, and God has to forgive me. But he really doesn't want to. Remember this whenever Come you're on. tempted to think that way. Yes, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. No, there's nothing in me that can save myself. And yes, I need Jesus in order to be right with God. Yeah. No but, just that. Yeah. Now, from that, did the Bible start in Genesis 3? No. Come on. When we sinned and became separated from God? No. Or did the Bible start with, let us make man in yeah. our wow. image? Wow. 
And when God made snakes, he said, it's good. Everything he made, he said, it's good. It's good. When he made you, he said, very good. Yeah. So I know you got some very bad things you struggle with and some very ugly parts of you that you're working on. And I know you have some very deep issues that go really deep. But remember that it started out with a God who made you. Right. Very right. good. Yep. yep. Very good. And God is trying to get me back as Stephen. Yeah. Larry Stevens Furtick Jr. Yep. He's trying to get me back to very good. Very good. Yeah. He's trying to give me a vision of his very good for my life. Yeah. He's trying to get me back to the seed of Stephen. Yeah. He's trying to shine light, give water, and yes, even fertilizer to your life to bring you back to what you put inside of you. So, Holly, for me, the whole way that this message, Do the New You, starts, and I won't review it long because we've already covered it, right. but it talks about do you, do you as possibly being the worst advice that anyone could ever give you. Because <laughs> if I just do me, but I don't develop me, right. I'm going to be a perpetual emotional two-year-old. If I just do me, if I don't grow into who God made me. On the other hand, if you're one of these people who's very driven and you're like, I'm not going to just do me, I'm going to do future me. Right. Future me. Well, that's a treadmill that will leave you exhausted and you'll collapse yep. trying to chase something that you think you're supposed to be. And usually what we're chasing when we say, oh, my future self. That's patient and ripped and rich and patient and ripped and rich, but can still enjoy a nice dessert. But I'm ripped and I'm not uptight, but I am driven and focused. Stop that because you are comparing your behind the scenes yes. to everybody Come else's on. highlight reel. Come on. Come on. And what you're chasing is a compilation of what other people have shown you of their life that you've cobbled together and think you need to be that for God to bless you, right. and you don't. Wow. Wow. So accepting Stephen means that when I show up to preach to you, or when I show up in a tough moment with one of our kids, or when I show up to try to be the husband that she needs, and I know that I'm still under development, that I believe that if God would have needed somebody else to do it, he would choose someone else right. to do it. And the fundamental component of my belief system about this is that if there are eight billion people in the world, God had options. <laughs> yeah. And he put you in that house. He put you in that business. He put you in that ministry. He put you with that woman. He put you with those kids. God chose you. Mm. Say it to your neighbor. God, God chose, chose you. you. Now look right back at him and ask him a question. Will you? Come on. Come on. Will you choose you? That's the decision you're making every day. Yep. Or are you going to feel the need so much to measure up to something called perfection that God knew you were never going to be? Or can you be cool in the process? Can you say to yourself, well, I, I did cuss, but I didn't say the real bad words this, this day. <laughs> Next week, I'm going to dial it all the way down to heck. <laughs> and every step you make toward heck, you got to be like, that's pretty good. If you saw where I came from, it wasn't heck. <laughs> and I'm passionate about this because I am a perfectionist. Yep. I don't know what version I think God is looking for when I come through the door, but sometimes I just have to sit myself down and be like, dude, you grew up in a small town. You stepped out. You met this woman. God's been good to you. You're doing all right. I always wondered, though, Holly, I wonder what you think about this. Where's the line between 
being content mm -hmm. and being complacent. Yeah. It's tough. Because I want to be content yeah. in every circumstance, but I don't want contentment right. to turn into an excuse yeah. whereby I can just accept immaturity in my life. Yeah. The first step of growing into who God knows you are is to accept who you are. Yeah. Accept it, accept it, accept it, and step into it. Yeah. And we'll get you from this bar, and we'll put some plates on it, and some more plates on it, and some more plates on it, and you'll barely recognize yourself. Yeah. This is the process of transformation. Yep. Yeah. Okay, you, you um, open up this section, this mindset, Crisis in Me, I Am Enough, with this story that you tell about um, dropping a class in college and the professors say to you um, something, they imply that, that they knew you weren't a serious enough student. And then you say this later in that chapter. You say, I'm constantly fighting a voice that tells me I'm not deep enough as a preacher or that I'm not serious enough or I'm not a hard worker. And then all that defensiveness is going to come out in how I preach and teach. I'll subconsciously think, oh, this needs to be deep. I need to be deep. I can't get on that platform and be shallow. I've got to prove to the people wrong who said I'm not deep. And then you talk about, you go on to talk about performing for the wrong voices in our lives. So how do you catch yourself when you find yourself living for the wrong voices, and how do you get yourself back? Can we do it in stages, the answer to that? Yeah. If it's a sermon, I'll put Eric on the front row while I'm studying. Eric's been my best friend since we were 14. We did Green Day shows together, Pearl Jam shows together, and now we spread the gospel together. <laughs> <laughs> and then. When I put him on the front row, I realized, wait a minute, Eric isn't thinking about me like a seminary professor judging if I said Mephibosheth right. And then I say, and nobody's going to know in your church if you mispronounce Mephibosheth either, because they can't say it right either. <laughs> and once I lock in through a lens of love, somebody that I love and somebody that loves me, it frees me up. That's good. Lock into the lens of love. Yeah. Lock into the lens of love. Even in your Bible reading, when you're reading the Bible, start explaining it after you read it to somebody you love. Wow. Join an E group. <laughs> it's not too late. It's not too late. <laughs> and I wish it were that easy in our lives because when you're performing for somebody else's approval, Come on. There's one story about Jesus that I want you to go back to. I want you to go down to the Jordan and almost like picture, if you can put yourself there, Jesus is being baptized. Why? To be cleansed from his sin? No. He had no sin. To be obedient to his Father. And as he's coming up from the water, I'm about to blow your mind if you've never Come heard on. this before. <laughs> this changed my life. As he's coming up out of the water, a voice, everybody say a voice. A voice. A voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. Right. Wow. He was proud of his son. Okay? Now, I haven't blown your mind yet. You're like, That's nice. It's nice and it's cool until you put it in context, and then it becomes a game changer. What if I told you that at the moment that the voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, I am well pleased with him. Mm -hmm. What if I told you that at that moment, Jesus had not yet performed a single public miracle? Right. Wow. And God said, already love him. Yeah. Had not opened a single blind eye, God said, I'm proud of him. That's my boy. That's my girl. He had not 
fed the crowds a golden corral buffet from a happy meal. And God said, He's enough. Right. So when Jesus went to do all of those things, Lazarus, come forth. When he went to do all of those things, Pharisees, shut up. He wasn't trying to prove anything to the Pharisees. He wasn't trying to prove anything to Lazarus. So good. Because his starting place was the love of his father. Now, every day, I need you to find a way to be baptized in that love. Yeah. I don't mean you have to go get in the jacuzzi, get, slip, you know, get over the fence in your neighbor's jacuzzi. I, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually letting God baptize you in the enoughness that is him. It's incredible. It's incredible. So you can come from abundance. Yeah. I don't mean just material abundance. There will be times where you'll say like Paul, I've learned to be content in every circumstance, whether with plenty or with little. But one thing you will never lack a day in your life is his love and his guidance. Yeah. How many of you struggle with the scarcity mindset? I tell one little embarrassing story in the book. I'll share it with you right now. Um, Elijah, when he was about nine or ten, was grabbing napkins at dinner one day, and he grabbed like twenty napkins. It's probably five, but let's call it twenty. Makes, <laughs> Felt like makes, 20. makes it a little more justified what I did because when he grabbed the napkins, I start freaking out like, "You don't need that many napkins," and I gave him the greatest lesson on napkin conservation in the history of parenting. And I don't think he should have wasted the napkins, and I think it's good. But I remember, Mom, do you remember how, how Dad, when he was growing up, he was very poor, and so when he had his own house and his own napkins and paper towels, sometimes he'd walk around, and he would tear the paper towels in half, and he'd go, you don't need a whole paper towel. <laughs> You think you're some kind of prince coming in here taking a full paper towel? Now, I'm bringing this up. It sounds so small because when we make it too big and we think like when you stand before the Red Sea, stretch out your staff, you're probably not going to lead a nation of millions Monday. But you will walk around your house and ask the question is it enough? And the way you answer that question is not just tied to, is God enough? But it's how you answer the question, did he make me enough? Yeah. And here's where I think the gap is. Oh, I'm fired up now. Get up. I'm glad they got me a bouncy chair. I can swivel while I preach this. Get a little kinetic motion as I preach this. Because what you're talking about in the process of those professors telling me, um, we knew you weren't a serious student. That's how I saw myself. Mm. What they say about you only has the power you give it by the way you see yourself. Wow. I want to break this victim mentality off of Christians. Like that if somebody spoke something over you, you just have to believe it like it's your birthright. No, your father spoke over you. And whoever spoke over you what wasn't true, your father is over them. So watch this. I have a better word over my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have a second opinion from God. I have a truth from him. That's right. I have a revelation from him. I know the truth of the gospel. Come on. He's not against me. Come on. I am enough. He is with me. I can do all things through Christ. High five your neighbor, say you got what it takes. Got what it takes. So got we gotta we gotta listen to that voice. Yeah. I know a lot of people speak a lot of things over us. It happens right. to all of us. Right. They say stuff about me all the time. Yeah. But I got somebody else I can go to and say, Father, is what they said true? Yeah. And if it's not, and if what they spoke contradicts what he is saying, yeah. go with what your father spoke. Yeah. Yeah. 
ah, I love this stuff. Because I see you breaking free from this idea of what they told you you couldn't be. They didn't make you. If they didn't make you and they don't own you, they don't get to label you. Come on. God is my label maker. I'm made in his image. I'm redeemed by the blood of his son, and it's precious. And so am I. Got time for one more? Just talking. <laughs> no, you're Just not. Talking. You're preaching. <laughs> okay. I hope y'all are getting this at Riverwalk. I hope y'all are getting this at University City. I hope y'all are getting this at Ballantyne. I hope you're getting this in Greenville. I hope you're getting this in Raleigh. I hope you're getting this EFAM all over the world. I hope you're receiving yes. this word in your college in dorm, name. receiving the calling yeah. of an almighty God. Yeah. People can't cancel what God called. That's right. Come on. Christ is in me. I'm enough. I am enough. Yeah. Now don't leave that first part out. You just run around, I'm enough, I'm enough. I'm just kind, I'm just smart, I just important. Like that's great for a movie. But you get into real life on Monday, you're gonna need something higher to point to. That's right. And so that's where it comes from for me, babe, because if I did the self acceptance thing without Jesus, I would hit it dead end. Yeah. Right. I've got to know that he's with me and I got to know that he didn't make mistakes when he made me. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you one more thing before we get to your final question. And we got to do a part 2 of this. <laughs> yes. 2 3 4 5 I like to tell you these little behind the scenes stories. By the way, I don't holler when we talk about these things when it's just me and her. Wouldn't that be weird? Holly, touch your neighbor. It's like high five and bow. <laughs> but we do this. This is what we do. Yeah. Some of the best sermons I ever preached were our 3.2 mile walk yep. after Sunday when we start talking and then you start sharing. And I think you really need somebody that you love in your life, whether in an e-group or whether somebody that you love where you can unpack the word of God because yes. if God speaks a word over you, but then you don't water it, yep. it'll die and you'll think it didn't work. Yep. But it just needs water. Yep. And I think what we're trying to model today, and I know it's a little different way to do it, but that God is a conversationalist. Yeah. And um, when I say do the new you, sometimes the only way for you to do the new you, singular, is to do the new you, plural. Mm. In the South, we don't say you all. We say y'all. So one day I'm going to do a group study called Do the New Y'all. Do the new y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I'm going to do it is because I want you to see <laughs> that if you keep hearing at the level of what God says, but you keep relating to people who are at the level of what they feel, you will come down to them time after time. Wow. And so this, this core belief for me, um, we were in a songwriting session a few years ago. You know, a lot of people will ask me sometimes, what's the best song you ever wrote that was underrated in your mind? I think one that I really like, and I don't know if it's underrated, but nobody ever talks about it. It makes me mad. Um, it's called The One You Love. It's definitely and not underrated. When we were writing that song, um, well, why aren't y'all streaming it? There's no streams on Spotify for that song. Y'all <laughs> clapping and stuff. But um, the song was a journey with some other great writers. And I don't say this to insult any of them, but at, at one point during the writing session, there were several writers, and we were working on the song. And the second verse began to come out in a way where it said, I know you're proud of me, even though I don't deserve it sometimes. No, I'm not a perfect child, but I still make my father smile. I know you're proud of me. And then the chorus said, You take me just as I am. You would choose me all over again. 
I am the one you love. You know that's what John called himself in the Bible. Yeah. The one he loves. The one he loves. And somebody in the room said, I don't know if theologically I can really vibe with the fact that God is proud of me. And I said, Then you don't have to sing it. But I've got to. Because I deal with so much self critical internal dialogue. And maybe you don't. And if you don't, I'm happy for you and I hope you never do. But God sent me to reach a few people that you don't know how to hear that voice saying, This is my child. I saw you go out of your way for that person, even though they didn't thank you. I saw that. I see you giving what you have, even though you feel like you blew it and you yelled at the kids six times today. The reason you're yelling with them is because you're with them. To say that again. Yeah, sometimes the Lord will say, I'm proud of you that you were so caring to your kids today. And sometimes they'll say, I'm so proud of you that you didn't kill <laughs> your kids today. Now, I realize that people will take this to the extreme sometimes and just justify behavior that, that frankly, God wants to rescue you from. But even if you're going to grow out of that, you're going to do it by accepting that you make your father smile. Yeah. Even though you're not a perfect child and you've accepted Jesus, if you haven't, you ought to do it today, but you also ought to accept you. Yeah. Because he did. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He accepted you and you don't? You have a higher standard than God? Whoa. Whoa. So I just want you breathing in this thought, Christ is in me. I am enough. Say it again, Christ is in me. Christ is in me. I am enough. I am enough. That's the most powerful revelation, I think, in the whole book. Yeah. Not I'm gonna be enough. Yeah. Boy, God's really gonna want to hang out with me when I'm no longer dealing with this. Mm. Man, he's really going to use me when I get smart. No, no, no. He's going to use you stupid. Hmm. Ask Peter. All these Bible characters we read about. I don't know how you wanted to close, Holly, but I had one more thing I wanted to share Do in it. order to solidify this. Close this off. Is there any question that if you didn't get to ask it, you're going to fuss at me later because I didn't let you ask the question? I'm good. Okay. I'll talk about one more song line and we're going to sing and worship and just uh, close this time by reflecting and responding on what God has spoken. How many feel that God has spoken something to you today? No. I think yeah. I think this is one of those messages that you do need to get in with your e-group or yeah. sit down with your notebook and your coffee yeah. and 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 watch it back and listen to it again. Yeah. Because we talked about so many things, but there was something specific that God wanted to speak to you. So let me just bring it back to the entire revelation that Christ is in me, I am enough, in a way that you can hold it in your heart. Because I don't want you going, well, there was a lot of good stuff. No, I want you to remember one thing today. The song Gyra, which literally Gyra means will see, S E E, it means that God will see to it. So when he called the place Jehovah Jireh, he was calling the place Jehovah Jireh, where God provided. This is from the Abraham and Isaac story. Anyway, that's not important. I don't even know why I said that. Probably just to show that seminary professor I know what I'm talking about. Here's the point. Again, in a songwriting room, as that song began to take shape, it was a very beautiful song with our friends Chandler and Naomi and Chris, and we sat there, and we'd never all written together. And I threw out a line that said, I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Yeah. And as Chandler began to sing that, and then we began to sing, I wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I could do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud, because I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Come on. Gyra, you are enough. Yeah. And as the song began to flow with different verses, it came to a point that crescendoed in saying, 
I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. Yeah. I know who I am. I know what you've spoken. I'm already loved more than I could imagine, yeah. and that is enough. Right. We sang it over and over again. That is enough. Yeah. That is enough. But as we sat in that writing room that day, it went to a different place. We began to say, you are enough. Yeah. You are enough, because my sufficiency is in him, not in myself. You are enough. You are enough. But what happened next is a life message that I want to give to you. Because immediately after we sang, that is enough, the truth, and you are enough, the God that speaks truth and is truth, we begin to sing, you are enough, so I am enough. Come on. So good. When we recorded the song, it was 18 minutes long. <laughs> right in this empty room, back when we couldn't have everybody together for church. And in that collaboration, some of the songs had to be edited way down because the Holy Spirit broke out in such a powerful way. We had to get Jaira to under 10 minutes because we couldn't put it out on the digital streaming platforms if it was one second more than 9.59. They sent me back several options. We could edit this. We could edit that. But one option they sent was unacceptable because it said, that is enough, the truth. And it said, you are enough to God. But in order to save time, they had cut out, so I am enough. I said, whatever we have to cut out to put that back in, I need that back in. Yeah. Because if you just say, that is enough, the truth is enough, you are enough, God is enough, right. it hasn't become personal right. to you right. yet. Come on. I want it to be personal for you, right. that he is enough. So I am enough. Come on. And you'll never be more loved than you are right now. Right now. Right now. Clap your Thank hands you about. Thank you, God. Just right here. Where you are. So beautiful. I can't hear what key we're in. I'm waiting to hear a piano so we can sing together. Thank you, God. That you are enough. Thank you, Lord. So I am enough. Thank you, Lord. You are enough. Thank you, Lord. So I am enough. You are enough. Thank you, Lord. So I am Now sing Jaira. Think about how he's provided for you. Yes, Lord. Those hands like you love it. Like you know he loves you. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it out, church. Hey, thank you for watching the Elevation Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe. That way you can know when we go live and post new content. Make sure to leave me a comment. Let me know what spoke to you today where you're watching from, and what we can pray for you about. And if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can click the Give button now and help us continue reaching people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.